Thank you. Uh, everybody hear me okay? I, I'm particularly glad to be here today since it's just two days after we once again honored the memories of those who fell at Pearl Harbor 73 years ago. But I'm always a kind of a little bewildered that we seem to ignore, in terms of national memory, a much far greater Pearl Harbor that took place, which is the subject today, the Pearl Harbor in the Atlantic. And I want to, before I talk about the two main people I wrote about, the 29-year-old German U-boat commander and the 23-year-old Army Air Corps bomber pilot who had a fateful encounter in July of 42, before I get to my main story, I'd, I'd like to just share with you what to me was, in a 35-year journalism career, the most explosive, mind-blowing discovery that I ever tripped upon. And as one of the gentlemen said earlier, I give that credit to Michael Gannon, because he is the gentleman who found it. And we'll get to that right now. As we know, as we know, as we know, the clicker's not working. On December 7, 41, everybody knows the basics. Six Japanese aircraft carriers achieved total tactical surprise, launched aircraft that sank um, six battleships, of which uh, two were completely destroyed, uh, another half dozen warships and auxiliaries, killed 2,400 um, Americans, most of whom were in the uniform, um, and destroyed um, more than two-thirds of the aircraft on Oahu. And nobody knew they were coming. Roosevelt didn't know. Um, Betty Stark didn't know. Frank Knox didn't know. Husband Kimball and Walter Short didn't know. The Japanese had achieved perfect tactical surprise by the simple virtue of maintaining total radio silence as they crossed the North Pacific. Yet these two poor guys got relieved of command on grounds of dereliction of duty. Their careers were over. They toiled through the war in practical anonymity, and their names are forever linked to this disaster. Well, I want to ask a thesis question. For 73 years, a lot of journalists and historians have been scouring the archives looking for the conspiracy smoking gun, and that is, Roosevelt and his military commanders wanted the Japanese to attack first, wanted us to be ambushed, so we, the American people would rise up in wrath rally around the flag and get on with the, the mission of defeating Japan. Now, ask yourself the question, what do you think would have happened to Husband Kimmel and Walter Short if they had found a memo that read like this? Top secret, date, December 5th, 1941, from Sinkus, Ernie King. Actually, back up, from Stark. 5 December, Imperial Japanese estimate Information received indicates large concentration of surface forces at 47 degrees north, 173 west, course 135, approximately 3,000 nautical miles southeast of ADAC. Projected course track places their warships within 250 nautical miles of Pearl Harbor by 6, 0607 December. Evaluation, Japanese Naval Task Force is en route to attack Pacific Fleet and U.S. Army Air Force's bases. Now, I'm not an expert in military law, but my thesis is if this memorandum had come out, those two guys would have been hanging from the closest lampposts on, on Pearl Harbor. But I have good news. I made this up. <laughs> <laughs> I have bad news. This is what I made it up from. This is a message that Michael Gannon discovered in 1996 in the National Archives. It is from Comanche, Admiral, um, this time it's Admiral Ernie King, he had just taken over. And it's addressed to every major Atlantic command from Greenland, Halifax, uh, commanders, uh, all units, land, convoy escorts, Westland, all naval coastal frontiers. And here's what it read. 12 January, 1942 sub-estimate. Information indicates large concentration of U-boats. Proceeding to already arrived on station off Canadian and Northeast U.S. coasts. Three or four boats, and then it lists literally their latitude and longitude positions as of 12 January 1942. This is the day before Operation Drumbeat, the, uh, the German U-boat offensive, began. This message was sent out to every major Atlantic Fleet command
from Key West to Canada and Iceland. I got out a, a, a navigation uh, program that I've used in my research, and this is what they knew. This is what Ernie King, Vice Admiral Adolphus Andrews at Naval Sea Frontier, and the entire Atlantic fleet knew on 12 January 1942, between 24 and 36 hours before they started torpedoing ships off the U.S. East Coast. They knew the position, the course, and their intention. They'd gotten this from the British. Um, the Operational Intelligence Center in London Citadel was the recipient of all the ultra uh, enigma code breaking. And even though these guys tried to keep their mouths shut, they did enough transmitting in encrypted uh, high frequency that the tracking stations in the United Kingdom, Gibraltar, and I believe I Iceland were able to pinpoint their locations and track them as they went across um, the Atlantic. And they sent that message, which was then turned around and forwarded to everyone. And essentially it was like, here come the Germans, you might want to do something about it. Well, I, I regret to tell you that they didn't do anything about it. And what's even more mysterious to me, Ernie King, in his second week as Comminge, and Adolphus Andrews, who had taken over um, the sea frontier in 41, not only didn't do anything about it, but they had the tools to do something about it. Because at the time this message came out, and, and it's in the archive, it's easy to find, there was a task force in Staten Island, New York, consisting of the USS Texas battleship, USS Wasp carrier, three cruisers, and 18 frontline Atlantic Fleet destroyers. They were fueled, armed, and ready to go. But where they were going was to take a convoy of four troop ships to Iceland and Northern Ireland. At the time this whole shebang was getting ready to blow, Winston Churchill and his aides were meeting in, the, in Washington with Roosevelt and his commanders in what is known as the Arcadia Conference. And one of their top priorities had been to have a public show of resolve of American soldiers leaving the United States on their way to Europe to show everyone, particularly Joseph Stalin, that the United States was getting ready to take an active part in the war. Now, as I say, I don't have any pretension of, of being a, a master strategist, but I just sort of wondered what would have been the harm in just saying, maybe we'll wait a week or two to send that convoy and meanwhile, let's go out and, and kick the devil out of these U-boats who we know are coming. And all I can tell you is that the evidence is totally unequivocal, but the memoirs and the official histories uh, from comments from King, from Andrews, from all of them are completely silent on this. There was an Atlantic Pearl Harbor, but they knew it was about to happen, and they did nothing about it. And what that did was set the stage for what not just myself, but other historians have said, was a defeat in the Atlantic during that six month period of 1942 that was an order of magnitude worse than Pearl Harbor. Excuse me. And it was also set the, the battlefield for the encounter that would come between the two men I was fortunate enough to write about uh, in the burning shore. Here's the enemy, <coughs> 29 year old, Captain Lieutenant Horstegen, fluent in English, an admirer of England and America. He was a member of the class of 1933 at uh, the German Naval Academy. In fact, he, he, he went there the week after Adolf Hitler uh, came into power. He spent five years as a destroyer uh, division officer before he volunteered uh, for the U-boat force. As we all know, the word volunteer lost every ounce of semantic meaning in Nazi Germany. Uh, he was on his first war patrol <coughs> at the very outset of the offensive against East Coast shipping when Reinhard Hardigan blew up the Nornis and the Cyclops uh, just offshore here. In fact, a destroyer from Newport, the USS Ellison, was on um, post-commissioning trials and actually they, they raced out and picked up the survivors from one of those ships. So his first two missions were pretty straightforward. The first one was off Newfoundland, the, the weather was horrible and he only managed to sink one ship. And in the second time around in, in April of 42, he and along with about a dozen other U-boats were diverted up towards Iceland because Hitler was afraid 
that Churchill was going to try and reinvade Norway. It was just one of his many fantasies. And there's U-701, one of the mainstay workhorse Type 7 C U-boats. Uh, the Germans built 760 or eight, 693 of them during the war, uh, and about a third uh, fewer, uh, 192 of the larger Type 9 uh, boats. D <coughs> displaced about 770 tons, had an unrefueled range of about 8,500 nautical miles, which would enable them to get from Europe to the East Coast, and they'd have a week or two for his, the fuel level would force him to go back <coughs> home. And here is his, one of his spectacular feats. What Degen did in his third deployment was to me one of the most daring tactical successes of the U-boat force. Uh, Doinitz had been ur urging all of his U-boat guys to shoot as many, sink as many um, Allied merchant ships as possible. And after about four months, the defenses were finally becoming effective enough that the Germans were having trouble doing that. Or as Winston Churchill said, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> um, by June of 1942, they had scraped together enough escort ships to, to put in a coastal convoy system up and down from Key West to New York that, that made it much more difficult for any U-boat commander to to uh, get in and sink ships, plus the Army Air Force has finally gotten its act together and had a pretty effective series of air patrols. So what Doinitz uh, in instructed Horst Degen to do, this is in May, uh, mid-May of uh, 42, was to load his U-boat with 15 powerful anti-shipping uh, mines that would go off by magnetic impulse that left him with only about nine or 10 torpedoes instead of the normal loadout. And he came across the Atlantic, kind of tiptoeing across on one engine to save fuel. And he essentially was charged to close all of the ports in the Chesapeake Bay. Baltimore, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Newport News, the whole lot. And he did it brilliantly, but he, he had some help in the fact that the, whoever's in charge of the lighthouses never turned them off. And so he and his navigator were sitting in their little wardroom on the boat as they were tootling across the North Atlantic, and they, f they figured out it was a simple, actually effortless problem to solve. He, he aimed his boat at the Virginia Beach boardwalk around midnight on June 12th, and he just, he, he just came in shore until he was about 30 or 40 seconds away from running right up on the beach, and his lookouts were watching the Cape Henry and the Cape Charles lighthouses converge, and the second they converged, that told him to turn right and just keep, ha keep going along the coast. He got to the mouth of the bay. The water was so shallow he couldn't submerge. So he put a running light on the torpedo, on the, sorry, on the periscope, and just came plodding up the channel, dropping mines every 15, 20 seconds, turned around, did the same, and got the heck out. And two days later, the Robert C. Tuttle and about 10 other uh, oil tankers were coming in from Key West and they tripped over this minefield in front of 50,000 tourists. So it was a very exciting day to be visiting Virginia Beach. Um, he sank two ships. Uh, the Tuttle and another big oil tanker were seriously damaged, but actually they were later um, recovered and fixed. Now, right as this was happening, the Army had been rotating patrol squadrons down along the East Coast as part of their effort to, to thwart the U-boat menace. And this little squadron from Sacramento, California, the 396th, was flying essentially what we know as the Lockheed Hudson, which was an updated and militarized version of the plane that Amelia Earhart had used in her attempt to circumnavigate. Carried a crew of five, three depth charges, and everybody hated it. It was apparently a, a real devil of a plane to, to fly. And the pilot that we write about is Harry Joseph Kane. Um, he's from Brooklyn, New York. He did what every patriotic Army Air Forces pilot did during World War II. He looked at this world headlines. He looked at his own situation. And he says, I don't think I want to be in the infantry. <laughs> so he went out. He, he was from an actual pr prosperous family. And he actually went out and got his private pilot license in 1940. So he just breezed right on through. Uh, he and his crew were out on patrol. Cherry Point at the time 
uh, this story happens, you, you think of it today as this huge, you know, uh, Marine Corps Air Station, but essentially the only thing that had been built was the runway, uh, the runways. They were still trying to build infrastructure and hangars and stuff. And his squadron just came in and landed. I, I, I think some of them lived in tents. Others had to, to get housing in town, you know, rooming houses. And they did this, this um, three times a day, a pair of planes would take off, fly 20 miles off the coast. One would split up and head towards Norfolk, the other uh, to the south towards Charleston in the hopes of, of finding u boats and none of them ever thought they really would because they were so small to see and the commanders were so incredibly quick to submerge whenever they, they saw an airplane. Well, he was flying back from Charleston up towards Cape Hatteras when he noticed that there was this cloud layer up at about 1,200 feet. And his squadron's doctrine was kind of stupid. It was like, we want you to fly at 150 feet over the water so you'll surprise any U-boat you find. But literally, you've got to trip over the thing to surprise it. So he decided to climb up above that cloud layer in hopes that the U-boat wouldn't notice him as he came along. And after about an hour of this, Caton looked out and he actually saw about eight miles away this tiny little line on the water. And he nudged his, his navigator and, and talked to his crew and he said, this may be a U-boat, let's go find out. So they turned, he climbed up a little higher, cut back on the engine sound came skulking in and sure enough, U-701 had come up to ventilate the boat because in July, in the Gulf Stream, the temperatures inside of U-boat were over 120 degrees. There was very little cooling from the ocean uh, outside. So he had come up for 15 minutes just to turn on the diesels, vent the boat, and then get back down again right as Harry Kane and his plane came along. And the third element <coughs> that led to the this, this successful attack and sinking was that Horst Degen's lookout was daydreaming. He was looking through his binoculars and thinking of his girlfriend. <coughs> and then he heard the, the message, time to go, let's go take her down. He dropped his glasses and he was his A-29 coming right at him. So they did a crash dive. He straddled it with three uh, depth charges, ripped the hull apart. The U-boat fell to 100 feet depth. But the uh, crew, who were very well trained, all but a handful of them successfully got out and popped up to the surface. And at that point, the story gets a little Hallmark card-like. Uh, Harry Kane's flying in a tight circle at 100 feet over the, the spot of ocean, and he suddenly sees these guys popping to the surface. And he notices that most of them have no flotation gear. They didn't have time to grab their little uh, talk radar uh, breathing devices. And so he orders his, five, his uh, four crewmen and himself to throw their life jackets out to the Germans. His, his, his thought, he, he said a, in an interview many years later that they were no longer the enemy as far as I was concerned. They were just a bunch of helpless guys in the water. So they did that and then circled for several hours trying to, to get either ships or airplanes to come out and, and, and rescue these guys. But for one reason or another, <coughs> nobody, nobody came. And he finally had to fly back to Cherry Point because you're running out of gas. They resumed the search in the morning, but it took 49 hours to find those poor devils in the water because they'd swept out to sea on the Gulf Stream. And by that time, only seven were still alive, including Horst Degen. So their second encounter was poignant. Uh, two days after the whole event, Harry Kane and his crew were ordered to fly up to Norfolk, Virginia uh, they were brought into the naval hospital and surrounded by armed guards in this one empty ward was this gaunt, sunburned, oil-stained wretch of a POW. And uh, some translator went up and mumbled in his ear, said, this is the guy that sank you. And he stood painfully up, saluted sharply, and in English said, congratulations, good attack. So that was the end of, end of their encounter. The, um, Winds of war swept the, these two guys far apart. He ended up back in the, the Aleutian campaign and then spent the last, I guess, year and a half of the war as a flight instructor in the Midwest. Degen ended up in Tucson, Arizona at the Papago Park PIDW camp, got home in 1946. So I'll just end uh, this little chat and take your questions if you have any, uh, describing the th their third encounter, which is my favorite. Uh, in 1980, both men had retired. Uh, Harry Kane 
started wondering, I wonder what ever happened to that guy I sank. And so he started writing letters to newspapers and organizations in Germany. And actually, they made contact and started exchanging letters. It kind of reminds me of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who ended their active careers, bitter enemies, but in their old age, actually started to become friends again. They extended correspondence for about three years. And finally, Harry Kane and his wife flew to Germany Excuse me. to meet them. He had married, uh, had three children, and when he met him, instead of saying, congratulations, good attack, Horst Degen said, thank you, Harry, for saving my life. So on that, I'll stop and take your questions. <laughs> Did you ever do research as to how these submarines were getting refueled? Well, at the time, um, I think it was about April or May, I can't remember the exact date, Doinitz set up a new submarine called the Type 14, which is a big, fat, unarmed, uh, they call it the milk cow. Uh, and they deployed these to the Mid-Atlantic to extend the range of the Type 7s and Type 9s by you know, serving as a floating gas station. <coughs> and it worked successfully, it was very successful in terms of extending their range, but one of the things I discovered was that it didn't really Im impact the killings of Allied merchant ships because by that time the convoys and the air patrols were still so, uh, were getting better and better by the day that the, the hunting actually was falling off. In fact, it was a week after U-701's destruction, uh, another U-boat was sunk very close by, the one they just found a couple of weeks ago, by the way, the U-576. And when Doinitz realized that uh, it just wasn't profitable anymore to be off the coast. He redeployed his force back out into the North Atlantic. The, uh, during the war, the French had a big submarine named the Turpus, I believe. And she worked out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And she would go out on patrol helping our submarine. And eventually, I was in the Navy with a fellow who was on a submarine. They followed the turpits out, and they were using so much fuel they became suspicious. And from what he told me, the turpits was laying to with a German submarine on either side. So they fired a spread of torpedoes. They went through the first ship, the submarine, and they sank all three of them. And uh, I wonder. Uh, it sounds like you've got a book to write. <laughs> I, I had heard vaguely about that sort of thing, but I, I know the, the, the refueling U-boats, the Type 14s, had very short, exciting lives because by the time they were being used in 1942 um, and, and, and even in 43, uh, the British and the Americans were getting much better at locating them and sending task forces out to hunt and kill them. So they didn't have any guns or torpedoes either. They were just essentially carrying uh, fuel and food. Yes, sir. Why was the United States so slow to get moving uh, against submarines in World War II? As I recall, there was a book written about World War I when the U-boats came to America. It's on my bookshelf. Okay, I, I had it as a kid, I don't know where it is now, but we had had, as I recall, during World War I, some very, very significant experience with the, the submarines. And it took us a, it seemed an awful uh, long time to get moving in World War II. Well, the example I like to use, there was, to me, a strategic and logistical hassle. And the example I use is the, is the destroyer escort. In 1940, one of the many good things that he did, Ernie King, uh, was on the general board. And one of his task forces strongly urged the, the crash construction of a fleet of destroyer escorts because the, the main DDs were too multi-mission and too badly needed elsewhere. But Roosevelt said no. He said, you can get by with patrol boats. And they had other priorities. And the Army wanted aluminum for airplanes. And, and everybody was just in this five-sided tug of war that kind of reminds me of what DC's like today. They didn't get the first destroyer escort actually out into the Atlantic until after the Allies had actually turned the tide. And then they flooded it. You know, it was like a surge. Uh, but the, the logistical answer is it just took too long to get an Army built and trained and get the Navy r equipped with the right uh, the right equipment, especially ships, with that, which had to be built and trained, um, 
er Ernie King's mantra in 42 was do the best you can with what you've got because that's the way it is. And, and you know, I, I cannot rewrite that history, but I'm still astounded at the fact that he knew they were coming within 36 hours that they were going to be attacking and he didn't even send a solitary destroyer out to just harass them, much less attack and sink them. So that, that's, you know, where I, I just take aspirin and keep going. <laughs> yes, sir. What are the final uh, U-boat engagements of World War II that happened right here off the coast of Rhode Island on um, Block Island? The 846, right? I'm sorry? Is that the U-846? Correct. Um, yeah, that guy was an idiot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is correct. It was explained why he's at the bottom of the ocean. With that said, though, um, can, can you speak intelligently as to that engagement? Um, um, quite honestly, no. Um, I, I've read about it, but the focus of my first book on the battle was, was strictly around the 12-week period in the spring of 43, when at the beginning of that interval, the Allies were actually afraid they were about to lose the battle. And then 12 weeks later, Doinitz threw in the towel and pulled out of the uh, North Atlantic convoy route. So that was kind of the focus of, of, of my first book. And then I, I had researched and written about U-701 you guys can handle this. 32 years ago, um, I was. <laughs> so my children can't. But uh, I was working in Norfolk, uh, the, the old Ledger Star newspaper, and I kept hearing about this crackpot U-boat guy that came right up to the Cape Henry Lighthouse and blew up, you know, a convoy. But there was very little in the archives available at that time to explain what had happened. And my editor got interested in it, and he he cut me loose to go try and and, and find out if there was any documentation of this, because the wartime censorship was so incredibly tight. I, I want, in fact, I want to interrupt myself and read you something that just made me laugh. Um, this is an official Navy communique that Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox released to the New York Times and the Associated Press in February of 1942. <coughs> And this is his words. There are many rumors and unofficial reports about the capture or destruction of enemy submarines. Some of the recent visitors to our territorial waters will never enjoy the return portion of their voyage. Furthermore, the percentage of one-way traffic is increasing, while that of two-way traffic is satisfactorily on the decline. But there will be no information given out about the fate of the enemy. submarine excursionists who don't get home until that information is no longer of aid and comfort to the enemy. This is a phase of the game of war secrecy into which every American should enter enthusiastically. The press and the radio have made a great patriotic contribution by voluntarily disciplining themselves in the matter of reporting such incidents as may have come to their attention. All the people can make the same contribution. Even if you have seen a submarine captured or destroyed, Keep it to yourself. Let the enemy guess what happened. By this conduct, every American can make his contribution to the Navy's worldwide effort to eliminate this. <laughs> well, there are two things that are nice about that. At the time he issued this, we had yet to sing a single u <laughs> 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 Um First rough draft of history. And the second thing is that Doinitz always knew when his submarines were lost because they stopped reporting back to him. And, and so he would, within 36 hours of no longer hearing from his U-boat, he'd cross it off the list. So, anyway. Yes, sir. In terms of uh, tonnage sunk during the war years, particularly from latter 42 into 44, German U-boats had a much more successful rate <coughs> of sinking ships than the Americans did. The Germans tended to be uh, much more um, are less risk averse than the Americans were. Could you explain the backstory to that? Behind that um, I, I think I, th I think risk averse is a little strong. I mean, I are the, the report. I, I mean, I, I have read as a reader uh, Clay Bla Blair's book about uh, the U uh, American U uh, U boats, American submarines in the Pacific. Um, I don't remember thinking of it as risk averse as much as first they were plagued by lousy torpedoes. Uh, for the first months of the war, maybe the first year even. Um, and the Germans were not all the daredevils. Uh, there was this one poor guy who got put up against the wall and shot for cowardice because they thought he was being too risk averse. So I think you have a population. There were, there were 
a handful of German aces that sunk over 50 to 100 ships. And then I go through the archives and there's U-boat after U-boat where the guy never sank a single boat, either because he couldn't do it or just didn't ever have the luck. So, can't help you. Okay, Anything else? Anyone else? Yes, sir. How many of our ships were sunk off the Atlantic in the first, say, 42? Well, th there were two overlapping campaigns. The, uh, along the East Coast, it was about 225 ships. And then another 230 or 40 down in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. So it was just under 500 ships total in those two semi-simultaneous campaigns. Um, I'm doing this from memory, but if I rec recall correctly, um, roughly half of those were American or Panamanian U.S. company flag and the other half were, were mostly British or, or the foreign flag vessels that were serving with the British merchant fleet like Norway and Yugoslavia. And, uh, the British inherited several thousand merchant ships immediately after each country was conquered. They would put out a radio sign to all Norwegian ships at sea, for example, saying if you want to continue to serve, you can uh, serve under the British Merchant Navy and, and the protection of the Royal Navy. And most Norwegians didn't want to go home and dock and, and have to report to the SS. So most of them did that. So in this campaign, it was 50-50. Uh, th there's a fam famous encounter. Ernie King had this deputy named Richard Edwards. I believe he was a vice admiral. And the Brits sent uh, their submarine analyst, uh, Roger Wynn, who, who ran the, the OIC that sent that message um, that, I, that I showed you, to, to Washington to encourage the US Navy to, to form a submarine fusion center tracking room um, really get going on, on, on coordinating and getting the tactics right. And, uh, and at first, Edwards kind of blew him up saying, you know, we're going we're gonna to teach ourselves, we'll learn how to do it ourselves. And, and Roger Wynn, who was a, a semi-paralyzed attorney in civilian life who was a brilliant tactician, jumped to his feet and said, the problem, Admiral, is half the bloody ships that are going down are ours. And, and you know, that kind of broke the ice and, and they actually did start to make more cooperation. Yes, sir. When I first went to sea in 1950 on tankers, the crews consisted of many survivors, and uh, some of them had been torpedoed three times. They always slept in their clothes. <laughs> Anything they wanted, they were prepared to jump overboard at a moment's notice. I had the the good fortune. I, I never met the gentleman because he had passed away before I came upon his memoir. But he was a British teenager named Richard Wynn. Um, and he kept a very detailed diary and later actually wrote his little private account of what had happened to him. And he claimed, uh, he, he, he saw the war coming and he said, okay, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to join the British merchant fleet. So he became a, essentially a, a merchant mariner. Well, as it turned out, he was three more times likely to die than if he had joined the Royal Marines <laughs> in terms of the statistics. So, and, he, and he went into the ocean once or twice. Exxon was. 48 ships yeah. in their own fleet. Did we, at this point, use any of the British experience, especially with their home fleet, to guard our own waters? For the first four months, January through like late April, they were trying everything and nothing worked. And then finally, they set up what they called the Bucket Brigade, which was a series of anchorages, like off uh, Point Lookout, uh, Cape Hatteras, Ocracoke. Um, I think there was one or two down near Georgia. And, and, and the ships would race from anchorage to anchorage during daylight hours, then lock the door, and they'd have patrol boats right off the anchorages. And that was kind of a halfway towards a convoy, and that worked a little bit. But essentially everybody knew that what you had to do was convoy. There was no other um, solution that would work. I mean, the, the U.S. Air Force, Army Air Force is bitterly hated convoy escort. They wanted to race out into the ocean, you know, their scarves and go hunting for U-boats. And But the easiest way to hunt for a U-boat is to your ships in a convoy because the U-boat has to come there if he's going to get anything done. So it, it finally sank in. It, it took, took about four months and about three or four hundred of the five hundred ships that went down before they finally, you know, as I say, did the right thing. Actually, there's no practical use for Q ships in World War II, was there? No, the, um, Ernie King tried it with two of them. The f uh, first one, um, the Carolyn, Caroline, uh, went out and had an encounter with Reinhard Hartigan in U-123. 
Um, Hardigan torpedoed it. it, you know, started smoking, but it was still floating. He came in closer, they opened up with machine guns and killed uh, a midshipman on board the U-boat. And so he got a little irked and uh, withdrew and just emptied his torpedo tubes into the thing. Um, and the entire crew was lost. So it, it was, the, the Brits used Q-ships in World War I, but even that record was kind of, I think they lost three Q-ships for every U-boat they successfully attacked, if I remember. Yes, sir. During the war, um, approximately how many of the U-boats that operated in the Atlantic, anywhere in the Atlantic, were sunk? Is, is there any estimate by us? Um, look, Gunther Buchheim, who wrote Das Boot, had it best. He said 40,000 German submarine, submarine crewmen went to sea in World War II. 30,000 of them did not come back. I believe it was 74% fatality rate overall for U-boats themselves, which is the hull. Because crewmen would, would transfer off, I mean there was, the, there was this fluctuating personnel thing so it, it can get a little squishy. But they had the highest mortality rate of any military branch in the world during that conflict. They used to have a submarine base in uh, Le Havre, France. They used to run in there. Mm -hmm. And I went through it. It's quite an interesting place. The, that's a small one, but some of the submarines there came here. Uh, yeah, um, D Degen, uh, his boat was uh, first at San Nazaire and then at Brest. And uh, my wife Karen and I actually went to San Nazaire uh, two years ago, and those bunkers are still there. The French thought about knocking them down after the war, and then they gave up. There's just not enough dynamite around to, to do it, so they, they rent them out. There was, a, there was a disco and a hydroponic farm and the Chamber of Commerce <laughs> where there used to be U boats. I gotta go there. Oh, it was fascinating. They, 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 I can't tell you that they preserved it. I think they would have loved to have blown it up, but it's just impossible. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you very much.